Hello everyone. This is Balaji Ramakrishnan from Acuity Knowledge Partners. Welcome to our webinar, Where Eagles Dare, Opportunities in Distance Debt Investing. The year started with a cautiously optimistic note as the US and China trade war was beginning to abate. With 11 consecutive years of bull market run, returns on most asset classes at record levels, S&P 500 alone returning north of 25% in 2019, gains in high yield emerging markets and investment grade were in the low teens. As we know, three months into 2020, we found ourselves in dramatically different macroeconomic conditions thanks to COVID-19. This black swan event, which led to a dramatic fall in global markets, was also followed by buoyant investor optimism in the last eight to 10 weeks and markets making dramatic recovery. Joining us today is distinguished industry expert, Teal Heimlich, investment manager at Pictet Asset Management. We also have with us Pradeepa Kupasubramanian, who heads the credit research practice at Equity Knowledge Partners. Pradeepa had the pleasure of working alongside Till during the 2008 financial crisis. Over the next hour, the experts will paint a picture of the current macroeconomic environment with emphasis on distance debt, share their thoughts on the opportunities and challenges in distance debt investing, touch on the role that specialist research partners like, like Acuity play in the research process, and finally, we will close with Q&A from the audience. Please feel free to send questions that you may have throughout the webinar, and we will get them answered. There is also a short survey towards the end, which we kindly ask you to complete. To kick things off, uh, I would tell, I would request Till actually to first start and uh, briefly share his thoughts on the fallout due to the COVID-19 and the global response to it. And in that context, what does that really mean for a credit investor? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, Balaji. Good morning uh, or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're sitting. And the next uh, 30 or 40 minutes, I will discuss the outlook for the distressed debt market and how I would uh, look at seizing the opportunities that are currently still available. Let's kick off with some slides on the macro backdrop. 2020 has certainly been an eventful year so far, and we're only in June. Of course, you all know that we are currently in the midst of the biggest recession in living memory. Global growth is estimated to be down almost 5% this year, more than 8% in the US and 10% in the Eurozone. Economic activity was down 40% at some point in China and in Europe, and almost 30% in the US. And we had this unique combination of a supply and demand shock. And unlike the global financial crisis, uh, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, emerging market economies are also witnessing a sharp GDP contraction. However, we've also seen a massive fiscal stimulus unleashed and central bank intervention. And this is expected to drive a substantial GDP rebound. However, it was very much uncertain when the different economies around the world will get back to 2019 levels. And meanwhile, global debt to GDP will have increased by 20% or more, and in many cases crossing the psychologically important 100% debt to GDP threshold, and meaning that central banks have to resort to deficit financing, even if nobody likes to admit to that. So how exactly have the central banks responded? Well, there wasn't much room for most of them to cut rates. The ones who could, did cut, and others resorted to more unconventional measures. Let's look, let's look at the next page, um, that's slide number nine. Basically, the Fed has done three things. It's provided sufficient liquidity to assure that key financial markets, including the treasury, mortgage, and repo markets, can function in a normal way. It's backstop critical credit markets including not only the markets for corporate paper, but also the markets in which municipalities and medium-sized firms borrow. And it's eased monetary policy by cutting rates by 150 bips and by buying longer-term assets. It also said it will keep rates near zero through 2022. For the ECB, the PEPP, Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, has become the main tool of the ECB policy response to the crisis. Earlier in June, the ECB exceeded market expectations in extending both the size and the time of that PEPP program. 
and in committing to reinvesting maturities, uh, maturing securities at least until the end of 2022. On the next uh, slide, um, there's a graph just to illustrate this massive increase in the central bank's balance sheet. The Fed has added three trillion year to date, mainly in US treasuries and mortgage backed securities. The ECB purchased 400 billion more bonds and increased the LTRO by 400 billion. So you'll, you'll see it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a massive increase and overall almost seven times as much as in 2008. On the next page, um, there's a graph to recap the policy responses broken down country by country. Uh, I think this data does not reflect the latest rate cuts by Brazil and then Indonesia. Uh, but you'll, you'll notice the general theme where emerging markets with the highest inflation and weakest fiscal positions have made the biggest rate cuts. Uh, QE was not an option there, really. I think South Africa is a, an exception, but uh, the jury is still out on that one. Then turning to the fiscal stimulus and the borrowing needs. Um, altogether, $10 trillion of fiscal measures have been announced globally to help fight COVID, and that's as of uh, mid-June. Um, that's up from $1 trillion at the beginning of April. That includes direct and indirect support to government spending, loans, equity investments, and guarantees. Um, a large part is the job retention schemes or furloughing uh, with quite generous terms, uh, sometimes uh, even exceeding people's salary before the crisis. Um, there's, there's also uh, unemployment insurance, tax holidays in the U.S. and in Germany, some uh, direct cash payments. In the U.S., uh, people have uh, received a check in the post um, by, signed by Donald Trump. Um, interestingly, less than 15% of the funds made available by governments via banks as loan guarantees for business have been used. That's uh, according to figures from seven of Europe's largest economies and uh, from, from uh, Bloomberg News. Um, maybe zooming in a little bit on the next page um, on the um, different economies and regions and uh, there's a uh, gap between the GDP loss and the fiscal impulse that you'll see. Um, some of that might be temporary, um, but I think you will see also, a, again, a, a theme that uh, some of the economies um, just don't have enough fiscal firepower to, uh, to really address the issue. Um, and then importantly, of course, countries with a stronger healthcare systems from the start have been able to combat the virus more effectively. In Europe, we have seen a major policy shift uh, by the European Commission uh, away from punishing state bailouts to encouraging them. Take a look at the next page where we have listed some examples. This uh, is uh, very much work in progress and we've, uh, since the slide was done, there has been several additions uh, um, but you'll, you'll notice the, the theme um, that aviation, retail, um, automotive, industrials uh, figure prominently on the list. And a lot of these uh, companies that uh, are yeah, being called uh, national champions. Thank you, uh, Till, for that uh, context and background on the monetary and fiscal response to counter this crisis. Uh, there were a couple of uh, key points there. Uh, fiscal response, much higher compared to 2008 crisis, higher degree of dependence on unconventional monetary policy, particularly because the benchmark rates leading up to the COVID crisis was much lower compared to 2008. Uh, Pradeepa, a question for you at this stage. Uh, is in this extremely dynamic environment, I mean, how do you segregate value from noise and provide insightful and actionable commentary to asset management clients? Uh, thanks for this, Balaji. I think a couple of very simple ways. Um, the team actually works and presents morning meetings. You know, they have constant discussions with the clients. And of course, our in-house asset class and industry specialist ensure that the team is updated with all the happenings around them. Um, before we actually get on to the next section, one quick observation and question to you, Till. 
like if we analyze the current market condition we do see a lot of investor confidence you know we could say over the last 10 weeks more specifically uh, we also notice that the bond and the equity markets have cut back most of the losses that they actually saw in early march or you know uh, in early march and may april so uh, we see that there is a lot of uh, there is ample liquidity in the market you know thanks to all uh, all the monetary and the fiscal response uh, that's been in place to top this all one recent event that drew everybody's attention was hertz planning to raise 500 million in fresh equity we all know that hertz had filed for bankruptcy in late may however thanks to sec's review this was cancelled all these events actually makes us uh, makes us think are we really in a distress situation till uh, can you please share your thoughts on this uh, yes, sure. I mean, that's a question we, we obviously uh, get a lot and discuss a lot internally as well. Um, I think investors' renewed optimism uh, it's, it's, it was based on the following uh, key assumptions that COVID-19 has peaked and is now under control. Uh, the, the economy is recovering fast uh, as lockdown measures are eased, that fiscal and policy stimulus will work, and if not, more will be done. And you know the uh, the other topics on the back of our minds: uh, U.S.-China tensions, just rhetorical. In a in a year where we where we have uh, elections in the U.S. and uh, Europe uh, getting it back together with that recovery fund, uh, reducing risk in the periphery. So overall, that uh, this crisis is temporary, really, and and so is the hit to corporate profits. Um, furthermore, there are really no alternatives to uh, uh, equities in for, for investors that need to make uh, returns. Um, so, you know, is there going to be a distressed debt cycle? Well, um, equity markets are not necessarily reflective of the broader economy, um, especially in the U.S. Growth sectors are overrepresented. Um, IT or you know tech stocks, uh, uh, healthcare, and so on. So uh, the fangs make up more than 15% of the total S&P. Um, but the real economy, the main street, uh, there are lots of unlisted companies that can't get funding so, so easily. Um, on top of that, there remains a lot of uncertainty uh, if there will be another wave uh, or you know, when the first wave is over, uh, if we think about some of the countries that are still seeing uh, rising uh, active cases day by day. And uh, then you know, going into the winter months in the northern hemisphere, how many people are actually immune to this virus now um, and uh, uh, you know is there, is there a risk uh, going going into the winter then the ongoing issues uh, as mentioned earlier so this uh, uh, the trade tensions and then probably also the coronavirus will lead to a deglobalization trend and uh, uh, with all these uh, interventions fiscal stimulus uh, what are the legal levels of uh, corporate and personal taxes in the future and what does it mean to earnings and then lastly uh, you know things like brexit uh, are still something that should be on top of people's minds in europe so to, to me it doesn't feel like a great time for companies to ramp up capex or start hiring people but um, uh, even away from the eternally bullish equity market credit indices have recouped more than half of their losses and uh, if you look at the next page uh, at slide number seven uh, you'll see the uh, this massive uh, inflow or this liquidity that uh, has come into the credit market, um, really unprecedented, uh, uh, the, the largest IG bond inflow ever, and and, and so on. Um, well, you know that uh, that is uh, obviously very helpful in the short term, um, and uh, and might mean that uh, this. Uh, this distress cycle is not as uh, acute as you, you would have thought at uh, the beginning of March, um, but uh, there's definitely still going to be a cycle. Um, look at the next page. The, uh, these inflows in credit have been balanced by a lot of new supply as well. So uh, the absolute numbers, i.e. the universe of high yield uh, debt, and the distressed debt universe has grown substantially. And why is that? Uh, we have seen a lot of rating downgrades and companies raising cash to weather the crisis. As far as downgrades are concerned, people tend to focus on fallen angels. And there we have seen 
US dollar denominated uh, um, credit, fallen angels uh, uh, up to 150 billion year to date. We've seen some big capital structures downgraded, Kraft Heinz, Occidental Petroleum, and Ford are the three largest. Uh, in emerging markets, it's, uh, it's more than $70 billion year to date, and uh, Pemex is the largest issuer there. In Euro denominated credit, uh, Fallen Angels have now edged beyond 55 billion, and uh, more than 50 of that is coming from corporates. And then on top of that, you have the sterling market uh, as well. So given the economic situation and the numbers of issuers that are still on negative outlook or rating watch, the Fallen Angel total could grow to 10% of the market. And only for the US triple B market, uh, that would equate to nearly $300 billion. And that would represent 25% of new high yield supply that has to be absorbed by the market. Um, the major driver of these rating downgrades is the weak fundamental outlook. Um, and we're, on the next page, we'll, we are showing you uh, the increase in, in leverage. So, um, you know, we have collapsing earnings this year, but there was already much fragility coming into the crisis. And already at the end of Q1, U.S. corporate debt stood at 50% of GDP versus 40% before the global financial crisis. And uh, you'll see here on, uh, on the right of the graph that average leverage, average leverage in the high yield space is uh, uh, already higher than uh, five times, going towards six times. And uh, it's estimated that the recession impact will add another turn of leverage to these levels. So many companies are highly levered and while not imminent, will have to restructure sooner or later. Um, this unprecedented liquidity injection cannot solve solvency problems for the more vulnerable companies. So it will uh, prolong the, the cycle. On the next page, um, apologies, there's a lot of information on there, but it's really critical. Um, First, the, it's an important point to note that the leverage calculated um, on, the, on the previous page and in general is based on company reported EBITDA, but earnings are increasingly being inflated. 35% of leveraged US companies adjust their EBITDA and on average by, uh, that is by 25%. But sometimes that's more than 100% can be attributed to these adjustments. We work in the US uh, was, was a great example of that. Or uh, right now there's a company in the market in Europe called Adona, uh, out with a new issue, um, it's the same. Um, but corporates adding back or adjusting future expected cost savings or revenue synergies, the current EBITDA has become pretty much market standard. And it doesn't only happen in spin-offs or with companies undergoing M&A integration. Uh, for example, adjustments of the cargo and ground handling services provider WFS made up 43% of uh, 2019 EBITDA, and that's used in their covenant calculations too. And there was no M&A or, or other corporate activity. Already lawyers are telling us that they have seen clients wanting to make use of EBITDA before coronavirus. That would allow companies to incur indebtedness, including debt that primes existing investors, against backward-looking metrics stripped of the effects of the pandemic, only really to wind up with more leverage against an uncertain post-COVID level of forward earnings and cash flow. We have also an interesting statistic here on the bottom right, um, the, the, basically the number of zombie companies. Low interest rates and the ability of the lower rated companies to issue debt and or refinance has led to the rise of zombies. Um, so in extremely indebted companies, those with profits, um, EBIT less than the, the interest payments, and uh, that they will not be uh, able to stand or stay on their feet uh, or refinance existing debt loads without this historically low rate backdrop. Already before COVID, the number of zombie companies was uh, 548, according to the OECD. And that's close to the highest seen during the 2008 global financial crisis. Um, then lastly, covenants um, on the bottom left. Uh, QE has led to a demand for paper exceeding supply, leading to erosion of traditional creditor protection through covenants. 
senior loans with weaker creditor protection or cov light, they now dominate the segment in, in Europe. This is a data here for Europe. Um, from 2007 to 2013, cov light loans were less than 13% of the primary, and by the end of 19, that has climbed up to 80%. So what does that mean for investors? Um, well, we, we think that um, we need to be mindful of the fact as investors that recoveries are likely to be lower than before. On the next page, um, you'll see uh, that basically there was already a trend in place, uh, bottom left, um, that chart shows you the recoveries uh, in the event of default. And that trend has been in place long before COVID hit. Uh, we think it was exacerbated by lower equity cushions for cut light structure. Um, it's uh, in 2019, the equity cushion, so the, the part of equity that's in the LBO capital structure was 18% on average versus 33% before the global financial crisis. And um, yeah, the, the system is really vulnerable to a shock like this. And uh, so we've seen uh, CDS options uh, in the US. Um, there's been quite a few of them this year, but the most recent ones for the retailer JCPenney, the recovery was uh, fixed at 1.25 cents. And for other credit options, there was uh, Neiman Marcus with 3 cents, Diamond Offshore, White and Petroleum, 7 cents. Uh, before that, Frontier, 29 cents. Um, uh, Argentina, I think, settled at 31 cents. Uh, Thomas Cook, last one in Europe, was 10 cents. Um, there's Hertz today. You, you mentioned them earlier. Uh, the SEC, SEC has finally stopped that, uh, um, that you know, definitely borderline proposal to, to issue equity. But uh, uh, we also expect quite a low recovery there today. Um, so that that really drives uh, drives home that um, that worry about future recovery in this uh, in this um, crisis. Um, on the next page, you see uh, the leveraged loan market. Um, that that's the market that really relies most on protection from covenants and proper drafting of of uh, documents, uh, collateral agreements, and so on. In line with other asset classes, we've seen a significant bounce back. So that's not on the on the chart here, but uh, you know, 10 to 15 points maybe from the March March lows. But a large share of loan investors are rating sensitive, and the private downgrades are only expected to be felt in full force in the next few months, when uh, when the rating agencies have seen uh, um, you know April, May, June data, Q2 uh, numbers, and so on. And uh, there's a large air pocket uh, between CLOs that would like to sell their triple C or, or low single B exposure in the mid 80s and uh, high yield or distressed demand that's uh, more likely to be if they, you know, in the 60s. While uh, CLOs will not be immediate force sellers, um, they have these triple C baskets, but they they uh, they can't just sit and wait unless they have a strong view that those loans are safe from default. They will have to address them sooner than later. And uh, another point: as loans go uh, to triple C, it uh, it also means that there's always the chance that the the equity owner or the sponsor gets uh, gets a bit desperate and uh, uses these weak protections afforded by credit agreements. To move assets around, to raise new priming capital, etc. So the the buyers of triple C debt uh, will have to factor in these risks into the price. Um, the you know the the uh, situation right now in the market well publicized. Uh, a company called uh, Travelport, where lenders are fighting with a shareholder because the company has designated two of its entities as unrestricted subsidiaries and has transferred certain assets, including uh, a travel registration systems and patents valued at uh, more than a billion dollars uh, into these uh, unrestricted subsidiaries, so moving them outside of the reach of the, the creditors. Um, then there's Olympic Entertainment, which is a bond issuer in Europe. Uh, you know, just uh, earlier this week, they have done the same with uh, the online business and the Lithuanian uh, business. Um, it's a small situation, but uh, really a, a sign of the times what's, what's happening there. So, uh, 
you know, we've seen these uh, these things before. Um, there were cases like PetSmart and JCrew, uh, and you you think that uh, I mean these the, the, these situations have created shockwaves in the market in the past, but uh, it doesn't seem to have materially changed things or make the pendulum swing back towards investors in terms of uh, who's dictating these terms. Um, so yeah, let's look at the opportunities in the market. You've all seen uh, these graphs of uh, distressed um, ratio, you know, how much of the high yield market is trading at distressed levels. And when we say distressed, that is generally speaking um, a thousand basis points uh, over. Um, it was 40% of European high yield market and 30% uh, of the US high yield market, uh, clearly uh, peaking uh, since 2008. That fell quite rapidly um, to 17% and 90% respectively. Uh, that was at the end of May uh, as a result of that uh, unprecedented monetary and fiscal stimulus. Uh, but uh, the stress ratios remain elevated. And um, it's, uh, you know, as we mentioned earlier, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of debt still to, uh, to look at as a potential investment pool. Uh, maybe let's drill down a little bit in terms of uh, the sectors uh, that offer most of the opportunities. Uh, on the next page, this is just a return. Um, you could also look at the same and uh, look at the companies that are trading uh, to stressed levels by sector, but uh, you get the same results. Uh, in Europe, it was uh, mainly transportation, gaming, leisure, and consumer most impacted. In the US, it's um, uh, also energy. And um, energy continues to be a sector with many opportunities, we, we think, uh, uh, clearly exacerbated by the volatility, uh, what well, the recent collapse in oil price and then the rebound. Um, and we believe that generally that the lower levels of uh, oil prices and, and gas prices will uh, translate to, to meaningful reduction in capex spend and uh, in project spending and uh, will have a knock-on effect uh, on the oil services names which are really uh, levered plays on oil, and as such can be even more vulnerable than, uh, than the ENP names. Um, we think the energy default rate in the US could uh, therefore exceed the 27% we have seen in 2016. Uh, technology, telecoms, and healthcare are emerging as the key winners. Um, supposedly, uh, that, you know, there are uh, defenses, uh, um, some of them clearly have actually benefited from this crisis, uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, still um, interesting to see what if, if some of these companies maybe get uh, hyped too much and don't live up uh, to the expectations uh, that the market has now um, put in them. Um, brick and mortar retail uh, clearly uh, struggling and transportation, um, including airlines, uh, still have a lot of structural overcapacity and, and will have to consolidate, and that probably also extends to uh, the airplanes, so the, the underlying assets. On the next page, uh, we're just showing you that um, also compared to 2008 now, the opportunity set is broader, and you also have Asia. Uh, as a new market, or probably a market that more people will look at uh, this time around. Um, Moody's expects default rates uh, there to go to 6% by the end of the year. Um, sectors similar um, uh, as in Europe and the US, um, but uh, interesting and then probably setting um, that market apart from the other ones. Uh, you have quite a lot, uh, 100 billion worth of dollar bonds uh, that um, maturing between June 20 and December 2021. Uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see if uh, uh, that can be refinanced. Uh, there's definitely been less uh, uh, QE or, or stimulus uh, in Asia, so uh, the backdrop is maybe not as strong as, as in the US. And already back in uh, December 19, if you include the banks and PLs, um, the stress debt amounted to, to 1.7 trillion in China and $250 billion in India. So uh, yeah, quite a, quite a lot uh, in terms of opportunities there as well. Um, if you look at when these defaults will happen, um, experience tells us that the peaks and default rates 
they they will come nine to eighteen months uh, uh, after the peak uh, in uh, the distressed uh, ratio that we just talked about earlier. Uh, of course, nobody knows what exactly the scenario will be here um, when you look at the base case, the optimistic and the pessimistic case. But um, I think Moody's has actually updated that, um, and their latest forecast is 9% uh, uh, as a base case, worst case, 16% of the high yield market is forecasted to default. Um, that uh, ultimately will depend on the, on the depth and longevity of the recession. But uh, yeah, we uh, we are clearly in a uh, in a market that's very fragile, and uh, I think m more uh, recently the upgrade downgrade ratio. Um, I think we're saying here uh, that that downgrades uh, outnumber the upgrades by eight times. That's for the overall market. If you just take the U.S. leverage lending space, I think Moody's has said uh, it's uh, 43 to one. And um, yeah, just to add some background on these uh, default rate pr predictions on the next page, you see the um, the Euro Triple C index has grown to its uh, its largest size on record, an excess of 30 billion euros for the first time. And uh, typically, one third of companies default within three years of downgrade to Triple C. So that would just be 10 billion euros in the rated larger bond capital structures, and obviously it will be much, much more if you add the private debt and then SMEs and so on to that. Um, we thought it would be interesting just to uh, to recap a little bit, and uh, we have uh, two or three slides now. Uh, what we, uh, you know, when we talk about distressed debt, what we're, what we're really talking about. Um, on, this, on the next slide, um, this is uh, a summary of the key issues that lead to financial distress. Uh, liquidity crunch, probably number one. Um, inability to refinance if the market is, uh, is just not there for you. Uh, trade creditors requiring cash and delivery. Uh, probably a little bit less important uh, covenant violations. Uh, and then accounting fraud, which is something that uh, still amazingly uh, seems to be happening quite a lot. Um, these then uh, uh, basically can can end up in different ways. Uh, mostly, in most cases, it's a bankruptcy or insolvency proceeding, and uh, then companies can either reorganize and emerge, or uh, you know get sold to another firm or liquidate, and um, that is uh, obviously then the outcome with the lowest recovery for uh, for. Uh, Creditors, if it's uh, not a going concern, but a, but a so-called bond concern. Uh, we have already mentioned earlier some of the court overseen restructurings this year in the U.S. Um, the largest were Frontier, Telecom, Whiting Petroleum, Intelsat, Hertz, Diamond Offshore, J.C. Penney's. In Europe, the larger ones were NMC Health. Uh, Swiss Board is uh, right now doing a scheme of arrangement. Matalan has commenced one. Um, and then uh, there, there were a few distressed exchanges, Envision Healthcare in the US, uh, AMC, Digicel, and uh, quite a few coupon payments that were missed. Um, so that is really, uh, you know, gearing up for restructuring, um, you know, TravelX, Taco, I mean, these are all European names now, Hema, Boparan, Pizza Express, Selecta, Intralot, Codera, Lycra, these, these are some of the uh, more topical names there. Um, on the next page, you see some of the main things uh, to focus on when looking at the distressed companies. Um, so, first of all, you know why why is it interesting, uh, uh, you know, to to invest in distressed debt? Um, it is really to exploit mispricings that exist due to imperfect information and uh, you know inefficient or less efficient markets. For these securities, um, we've already talked about uh, potentially forced selling, um, and uh, some some of these things. You know, you can't just go and buy it a, a leverage loan. Uh, you, you, there's potentially a whitelist or a blacklist, uh, and uh, not everybody can hold loans and so on. So uh, there's a lot of technical factors as well. Um, why imper imperfect uh, information? Well, often there's no public research available. Uh, financial reporting might be limited and or dated, or there's language barriers and legal issues. 
Um, well, the basic idea is to buy assets at a price below their intrinsic value. And how do you do that? Uh, you need to decide, is there a structural problem with the business model? Or is it just that the capital structure is not appropriate when a company goes through maybe a, a cyclical trust? Um, and uh, then something you, you always need to keep in mind is, uh, is this going to be an in-court or out-of-court restructuring because there's cost and time implications? Um, then it, it, it's very important to look at the jurisdiction and uh, is uh, how value destructive could a restructuring process be if it's a jurisdiction that maybe is not that uh, creditor friendly. Uh, we've seen a lot of companies shift Comey's to the UK because the uh, UK is generally regarded as one of the more creditor friendly ones and then uh, quicker ones, um, but not every company can do that. Um, if it's out of court, uh, under which law are the debt securities, uh, by which law are the, the debt securities governed? Um, and then, uh, you know, is there maybe a new money need? Uh, who's prepared uh, or best place to fill that need and in exchange for what? And lastly, uh, what are the shareholders going to do? Or could there be interference from other parties such as pension trustees, regulators and trade creditors? So, um, yeah, as you can tell, it gets qu complex quite uh, quickly. And uh, apart from analyzing companies, a substantial amount of time will have to be dedicated to, to other things. Sourcing the assets, as well as uh, speaking to financial and legal advisors, and especially in Europe, the experience uh, on the legal side with these non-harmonized restructuring processes is critical. Um, it also really pays off to have a, ben a bench of analysts uh, um, monitoring the high yield and, and leverage loan universe. So, when there are these, these rapid sell-offs, as we've seen in March, that you can uh, capitalize on them quickly because you you know the company and you know which ones you you want to buy when they sell off. In March, uh, there was uh, at some point one trillion dollars worth of credit trading at distressed levels, basically a quadrupling from February, uh, close to 2,000 bonds, uh, whereas it was uh, um, less than 300 at the beginning of March. So. Uh, that speed of the move was uh, unprecedented and uh, you know we shall see what happens in the future but uh, uh, also the, the rebound was uh, was really quick so uh, not everybody was maybe able to to get uh, involved as much as they they liked um, we still see opportunities and the stress credits with uh, upside potential from policy support or from a resumption in economic activity. Uh, just to give you some examples, uh, um, container shipping companies or uh, some of the first lead debt in the cinema operators, some uh, banks in the periphery, um, for example, Montepaski, where uh, accommodative policy transmission to the periphery through the recovery fund and then through the ECB uh, will, uh, will probably soften the blow. And uh, I think also the European Commission has realized in this crisis that NPLs should not stay on the bank's balance sheet for, for the years to come because that really slows uh, economic growth. Um, there's also interesting opportunities in some short dated bonds that uh, trade at still um, quite wide levels, um, thinking of uh, Carnival Cruises or 2E21s, and that can be hedged with puts if you are uh, not convinced about the recovery. Uh, we would remain cautious on these zombie-like firms that we talked about earlier, i.e. the sectors uh, where there's capacity overhangs or structural decline. Um, and, uh, you know, we, uh, everybody, of course, knows about retailers. Um, uh, but, yeah, we are cautious on, on retailers and, uh, and commercial real estate to that uh, extent. Um, uh, but there, there are numerous other sectors as well that uh, fit that description. Uh, in emerging markets, uh, we see risks for some sovereigns and, uh, and companies located in these countries. And top of the list there are Turkey, South Africa, Brazil, and maybe you can even add uh, you know, something like Dubai to that list. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in summary, we believe it's really important to be able to uh, invest uh, globally and you know, pick your spots. Um, and, uh, and do that as well flexibly across um, asset classes. 
loans, uh, bonds, uh, equities. Uh, and, uh, and given that the market seems to be uh, already going into overbought territory again, that uh, it's also important to be able to, to short some, some, some names. So that's it Back to you, Banerjee. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Till, for uh, some excellent insights there. Uh, I particularly liked um, your point around uh, liquidity injections cannot solve solvency problems. And then from an opportunity perspective, you highlighted uh, some key sectors like transportation, gaming, consumer products, energy. Uh, and then from an analytical consideration standpoint, look at, uh, you know, your points were more around, um, look at if there was a structural problem with the business model or is it more to do with the capital structure linked to market cycles and equally having a really strong team of analysts uh, to support the volume of work that's uh, uh, coming in the space and likely to come in the foreseeable future is quite key to be prepared. Um, so at this stage, I would like to bring uh, Pradeepa back in and uh, perhaps start kick off things with a question again for you, Pradeepa. Uh, Till touched upon the challenges that uh, distance debt investors face and from a practitioner standpoint, Pradeepa, what is your experience that as a, you know, as an offshore research partner, how do we address these challenges? Um, I think, Balaji, it's really through our people and the tra training platforms that we have internally. So um, if you look at our leadership players, um, you know, they stable hands as a solution to meeting the challenges around the distress debt requirements. Um, this team has actually witnessed the 2008 downturn and now is involved in setting up uh, very distress debt focused engagements. It also, uh, you know, is involved in training the team so that they can handle new challenges. Just to quote an instance, since 2019, uh, from when we sort of, you know, foresaw that, you know, this could be the situation, uh, we have uh, trained close to around 45% of our analysts with uh, four to six years of work experience. And this has really helped us, you know, ramp up teams in a you know, very extremely short time frame. Great. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Pradeepa. Uh, we now move on to Q&A and there are quite a few questions that have come through already. So I'm going to pick a few of them uh, so that we can dedicate some time towards those. So the first question, Till, is uh, what is your view on the US slash global CLO market? Is it anywhere near as destabilizing as has been made out in the press and how does it impact your space at the moment? Um, yeah, so we we haven't seen the uh, a big uh, impact in the European CLO market. Um, there, there was definitely stress uh, in the US market in March and April with big drops and actually trading volumes there. Uh, I'm thinking about the the, the MES and the um, equity tranches, but even to some extent triple A because. Uh, there was a lot of uh, leverage um, on the side of the buyers that uh, would normally uh, uh, buy these things and level them up. Uh, that was suddenly not available anymore because the uh, repo lines got pulled. And, uh, uh, the, you know, they're in, a, in a relatively liquid market, uh, there were big, big price drops. Um, that didn't really happen in, in Europe. And um, uh, we in Europe have a different buyer base, but also... Uh, probably a a smaller market uh, uh, that doesn't trade as much. Um, so there wasn't a huge op opportunity for us um, going forward. What I would expect is all these rating downgrades that we talked about uh, to drive down the prices of the CLO tranches. And um, then we, we will uh, definitely look at that. Um, is this going to create a systemic issue like some people uh, predict or, you know, is it uh, analog to what happened in, uh, with ABS in 2008, 2009? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Um, I think it's uh, going to be one of the uh, interesting or, you know, more affected uh, uh, markets next year um, or later this year. But uh, I, I, I don't think right now there's a, a threat to the banking system, for example, and um, worth looking at the shadow banking market um, or these, uh, you know, the larger asset managers. Uh, one thing to note there is um, quite a few daily liquidity funds, um, some of them uh, absolute return funds that uh, um, even, you know, are being sold as triple B or double B kind of uh, uh, risk funds, 
they own large chunks of structured exposure and if they had to liquidate that it would be very very difficult to do that at a at a price near to where they're marking it so um that's a space to watch so cu coupled with the you know uh, liquidity deteriorating again in the market that could be a, 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 a yeah stress in the system thank you uh, thanks for that. The next question is actually an equally interesting one with uh, this is particularly to do with uh, Wirecard, which has been in the news, particularly over the last week or so. The stock price is down almost 90 percent. And uh, from what we know, um, there are indications of spurious activities in accounting and auditable information. And um, and you in your uh, discussion uh, till mentioned accounting fraud is perhaps one of the key reasons for you know, bankruptcy or financial stress. So from an analyst perspective, could you share your thoughts on, you know, how should, uh, how should an analyst look at numbers and, and, and really try and see if there has been any kind of misrepresentation and what would those factors be that you would recommend one should look at? Um, yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's a tricky one. So uh, I would start by looking for the usual red flags, uh, which uh, tend to be the uh, disconnect between profitability and, and cash flows. Uh, then just generally limited disclosure uh, or transparency, uh, management not answering questions, uh, but uh, uh, what they like to do is uh, uh, if it's a question they can't answer or don't want to answer, say, uh, oh, yeah, we'll take that offline or we'll come back to you, um, these sort of things. Um, complicated corporate structures with different auditors located in different countries, Auditors, I would have said auditors that are not big four is a red flag. I think that might have to, <laughs> I'd have to change that now, um, uh, you know, but it's um, where, whenever there's a, a very long auditor relationship uh, and, um, uh, you know, something that, that can potentially cause, uh, cause trouble. Um, we, in, in the case of Wirecard, so a bit more particular here, um, we had a, a small, a very small group of top managers um, who worked together for a long time, literally more than a decade. Uh, there was no outsider with work experience from a from a reputable competitor or or relevant tech company. There was a weak supervisory board uh, with <clears throat> with no expertise on on the tech side, um, and the company and their presentations uh, resulted heavily to using. The, these technology buzzwords, uh, AI and so on, uh, in order to distract investors from the from the underlying, um, you know, fundamentals that that were really not there. Uh, but of course, it's all, not always possible to spot it from the outside. Um, and uh, it's uh, you know, it's it's risky uh, to to short companies uh, um, because. You, you you won't necessarily get the same access to to management management and and so on and um, generally the the equity analyst or the sell side is not not as happy to talk to you but um, unfortunately it seems that uh, nowadays we still have a lot of these cases um, I mean Wirecard was one but let's not forget there was a, a NMC Health and Finabler in, in the UK earlier this year and. Uh, uh, there's lots of cases in Asia, um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's something that uh, unfortunately is still um, part of our, our daily daily bread. True, thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, there is a question here for you, Pradeepa. Actually, um, how much experience does Acuity have in distressed debt? Can you explain how do you set up and scale a typical engagement? Uh, thanks for that, Balaji. I think uh, maybe I'll take it uh, very shortly first uh, on experience. Uh, we saw the first distressed situation way back in 2007, uh, 2008 timeline. So that said, we are at least uh, 12 plus years old on the distressed debt scenario or analyzing a distress issue. Um, you know, though, you know, when the markets were doing fine, we were more on, you know, stressed or looking for, you know, scenarios and more on those lines. 
as for setting up teams is concerned balaji i think it's extremely bespoke and custom made um i think uh, what we primarily uh, you know look at uh, handling or look at delivering is a very bespoke solution so that you know uh, if the client wants if uh, you know a client wants us to do model building we primarily support them on that if it's going to be bankruptcy if it's going to be anything on chapter 11 we support them more on those so um, i would say that it's much more bespoke and customized is what we look at as far as uh, providing services to client is concerned okay thank you uh till there is a question here for you which is uh, in a post covid world where perhaps more office space is required to ensure adequate and permanent distancing why are you still cautious on commercial real estate despite despite what could be very interesting valuations could that sector surprise on the upside as already starting to show in continental european property trends in prime locations um yeah so being cautious on commercial real estate um i should say that there was more referring to a uh, retail part of commercial real estate less uh, on office um that said uh i think there's going to be an offsetting factor uh, which is uh that that companies probably need more space um to accommodate the same number of employees but uh you know even with all that stimulus we're going to have a pretty big downturn this year and uh it's not necessarily a um a, an environment where people will want to start leasing longer term uh, entering longer term leases uh um locking themselves in uh, for an amount of time while while we are in this crisis and in in a pretty uncertain uh, overall uh, outlook so i uh, i don't think there's uh, there there's a necessarily a positive impetus for commercial real, real estate on the other side from that i think um yeah the the sector has been buoyed by interest rate cuts or, or or you know central bank actions that that always helps uh, so it reads and so on um uh but uh, it's not necessarily a a um a factor that will help um the sector massively um i should also add that um i think uh, you know all these uh, co-working spaces um while in theory they might benefit from the fact that uh, companies might need more space but don't don't know for how long so some people say oh, well isn't that a positive um uh for them and uh you know short term might help them uh yes probably true but uh, really these companies require a minimum density of customers to 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 be profitable uh same of course for restaurants and so on but uh um that that actually means that these business models will continue to be under pressure okay thank you and then uh the next question is um as consumer behavior changes due to con- uh, due to the coronavirus could sectors which are driven by shared consumption like we work and uber or say malls for instance would those be in distress is it fair to say short the shared economy um i mean we've seen the uh, the equity market uh, reacting quite heavily yes uh, you know everything is like looking at uber uh, for example um but it's not necessarily true for all of them um so we've seen already that uh some of the food delivery uh, companies uh, are actually doing quite well out of this um you you see that companies that uh share um you know car sharing companies like zipcar in london actually have uh, seen a, a pickup in in demand um because uh, people don't want to use public transport so they uh, they they rather uh, share cars um and that is also mm, beneficial to companies like uber so um uh, yeah i mean um, going back to what i said earlier whenever there's a minimum density of customers um uh that uh, required that that is going to be um challenging uh but i i wouldn't say it's uh it's true for the whole shared economy as such and i'm thinking of uh, somebody like an airbnb uh, i think they can probably adapt to the new environment with more hygiene and other precautionary measures okay thank you we'll take uh, maybe a couple of more questions in the interest of time uh the next question is um this is uh, what do you think is uh, next on the fed's buying spree 
given the unprecedented measures such as junk bond purchases, could we see a scenario someday in the future where the Fed is buying equities? Um, yeah, an interesting question. Um, I hope not. Uh, I mean, the Bank of Japan has, has done it, and um, it, it's really debatable whether there's a, a, a overall benefit for society or or even the economy or capital markets from it. I mean, they definitely uh, Japanese equities are trading still at a discount to to uh, to, to global equities. Um, uh, also, I think we should uh, mention that the Fed is not buying outright uh, um, high yield companies per se, but uh, at the moment, uh, um, junk you know recently junked companies. So the the fallen angels. Uh, um, uh, that were still investment grade before COVID, and um, it's uh, I think it's just designed to um, uh, yes yeah, so soften the blow a little bit to the market. But uh, given the bounce back that we've seen, I'm not sure that more is required at the moment. I think a lot of it is rhetorical, and uh, you know they will keep saying that they're ready to do more and so on. But it's just designed to prevent another sell-off. Okay. Thank you. And the last question is, um, uh, would it be right to say that the massive liquidity injection by central banks globally is creating another asset price bubble? And how long can central banks continue to do so? Would the bond vigilantes be back? Um, yeah, I think the risk of misallocation of capital is, is high, given borrowing costs are near zero for sovereigns and well, lots of sovereigns and, and corporates. Um, an IG rating by S&P or Moody's today is, is not only a stamp of approval of a company's financial management, uh, but it's almost a license to print cheap money today. And uh, in some cases, uh, it, you know, it was clearly proven that, that it was not deserved. I mean, you know, the, uh, some of the Frauds that uh, you know it's difficult for rating agencies, of course, to to spot the fraud. But uh, um, you know they they were rated IG, and uh, lots of companies came to the market uh, just before they got downgraded to junk. Um, you, you know Renault and so on. So it's uh, yeah, um, it, it's a problem. Um, but as long as investors feel forced to buy or are forced to buy, it will continue. I think. And uh, regarding your question on bond vigilantes, um, uh, yeah, more and more people are advocating uh, something called the, the modern monetary theory and claim that unless the economy starts overheating and inflation comes roaring back, that there won't be an impact on bond markets. Um, to be perfectly honest, I, I'm not smart enough to argue about that, but uh, for now, I'm also in the camp of, in that camp that says inflation will stay low for the next uh, six to 12 months at least, and uh, we won't have a, a major uh, bond market sell-off. But uh, needless to say, if that if that happens, then uh, yeah, I mean everybody needs to to run for cover. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Till, for uh, your very very insightful presentation and very candid response to all the questions. Uh, in conclusion, I also want to thank Pradeepa for sharing her views and bringing in the operational perspective, uh, particularly from a research support standpoint. And last but not the least, uh, thank you everyone for participating. Uh, hopefully it was a very useful one hour invested. Uh, before you drop off, there will be a, a, a quick uh, three or four questions coming up on your screen. It's a short survey, which we kindly ask you to complete uh, before we close the session. Thank you once again and stay safe.